speaking today. Uh, today we are going to be receiving an uh, update and a briefing from uh, the minister on a number of issues that uh, we have identified and requested him to come and brief the committee. Uh, we are happy that the minister uh, finally we are having you to come and brief us. Uh, this this is almost uh, one week before the last week uh, that we should be going on uh, on a brief recess. Uh, I think next week Parliament is rising to go on recess, so it is very opportune that we are having this briefing. We have uh, thought it proper that we should schedule another one just before we rise. Uh, on the state of readiness to save the 2020 academic year, which we're planning to have it next week. But in the meantime, I think let's proceed with this one. Uh, but I must say that yesterday we had a very good uh, plenary meeting of the National Assembly, where the president was appearing to uh, answer uh, questions from members of the National Assembly. Uh, it was quite a very good and fruitful engagement, particularly the discussion around uh, the current challenges that we are having with uh, COVID-19, uh, where we had to resort to this method of convening meetings, uh, virtual platforms. Uh, yesterday's session was a uh, a combination of virtual and other members present in the house. Some of us were in the house. And I think uh, indeed the president did well in answering all the questions and providing the details of what government is doing. Uh, so next week, we hope to get a final brief on uh, what the department is doing to save the 2020 academic year. With that, honorable members, can we take this opportunity and hand over to the minister to then brief us and take us through uh, the issues that we have invited him to take us through. Honorable Minister. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, I am going to lead the presentation today. I'm going to do it, actually. And I've asked Dr. Parker, Dr. Parker, are you there? that she will help me to manage the slide presentation. Yes, Minister, I'm here. Do you want me to put it up? Over. Please, if you can put them up, I would really appreciate that. Chairperson, um, uh, whilst the, the slides are being put up, let me take this opportunity uh, to thank you for giving us this opportunity and inviting us to report on the issues that you have asked us to. I would also like, by the way, to put it on record that I am always more than willing to come and engage or account uh, to the portfolio committee. As you know, Chair, your own situation is like that. Uh, the situation under which we are operating has led to many, many meetings. And so is the situation also on our side. Some of them being called at very short notice and uh, the challenge also of being part of the National Coronavirus Command Council. So as much as is possible and that we are able to plan ahead as much as possible, I'm always willing to be part of presenting and accounting to, through the portfolio committee. Uh, what we are presenting here is outlined on slide two, the next slide, down, which is uh, four issues that I was asked to come and update the portfolio committee about. The first one is on the establishment of the ministerial task team uh, on the review of the NESFAS business processes. That's on slide two. Uh, 
the slides and moving Dr. Park. I'm just trying to sort it out. Just hang on a second. I'm OK, I'm on slide two. Uh, the second matter that the portfolio committee asked me to talk about today is update on the decision by the committee requesting the minister to institute the review on remuneration of university vice chancellors. And the third issue is the funding uh, of the missing middle and the matter of student historic debt as the third issue, sets of issues. And then the fourth issue is uh, on the standardization of the student representative councils. I'll explain further uh, on that because once I, I managed to to engage the chairperson just to clarify this yesterday, he managed to make it clear as to what the committee was expecting. But I will talk to that when I come to it. The next slide then starts with the Ministerial Committee of Enquiry, as we call it on NESFAS. Uh, the, the terms of reference have already been published in the Government Gazette 43345 on the 21st, dated the 21st of May 2020. So that's done, Chairperson and Honourable Members. The Committee of Enquiry will conduct its work over a period of six months, which will mean that it will overlap with the handover period between the new leadership of NESFAS and the end of the period of administration, which ends in August, which is supposed to end in August. Uh, we would have liked that this report was presented before the end of the period of the administration. But because of the many other challenges, especially around managing COVID-19, we couldn't move faster than we've done. Although we've done tried our best to move now on this. Uh, I have appointed a team already. I don't know, Chair, I had requested that the names and the CVs of the members of the team be circulated to members. Um, I don't know whether members have got them. Yeah, we, we did receive the, the CVs this morning. That's fine. So I won't talk to them then, uh, but members must feel free if they want to ask any question. Uh, it's a balanced team which is chaired by an experienced vice chancellor, former vice chancellor, Professor Eunice Bali, who was also the first vice chancellor of the Salt Lake University along with a small team of other individuals, which includes expertise in finance, IT, and university and TVET student funding. That's basically what makes this the small team. This committee of inquiry, I expect it to, to act independently and objectively in relation to its terms of reference so that it can advise me uh, properly having done and satisfied it itself that it has done the work uh, properly. The next slide, the next few slides are outlining what one would call the background to the review, which I, I think it's important that I take members through that chair uh, so that we, everyone understands uh, the purpose, properly the purpose of the, of the review. In 2017, the NESFAS rolled out a new funding system for students at all universities and Tibet colleges. The new system, which we refer to as a student-centered model, involved the direct funding of students by NESFAS. The NESFAS student model was intended to provide an improved information technology platform for submitting and processing student applications. But also, we were trying to overcome some of the challenges in the old system. In the old system, students received an allocation with an upfront payment, managed and they were awarding and payments of loans to students, and thereafter submitted claims to NESFAS for payment to institutions. In other words, the institutions were managing NESFAS through their financial aid offices 
And all that Nesfa said to do was just to pay on the basis of that information. That was the old system. The new system was intended to allow NESFAS to directly manage allocations, students to know their funding status before registration, and also on signing a loan agreement form and schedule of particulars, receive their allowances immediately after registration. That's the, the system now uh, that is in place. But however, there were a number of challenges even with that in introducing that in 2017, because NESFAS underestimated the magnitude of the processes and timelines required to implement the new model effectively. In other words, it required much more capacity than NESFAS had if it was now to manage the system directly and deal with students directly. NESFAS did not have the requisite capacity and technical knowledge, which required a, a successful student financial aid administration from the start of the applications process to successfully funding students. The IT platforms and system built to manage the processes were not able to function effectively. I must say here, by the way, Chair, that it's something that I'm concerned about, which I will have to go back now being held by this committee, because I remember approving around 2010, 2011, if I'm not mistaken, and my officials can remind me after my presentation, the, the procurement for about 100 million rands of a new IT system for NESFAS. <clears throat> By 2017, it was being exposed as being inadequate. I don't understand why. I'm still very concerned to go back to that and properly understand why I would pay 100 million rands for an IT system, which then five, six years down the line is found to be terribly wanted. Also, there were huge delays in paying students and making funding decisions, and it was necessary for outside assistance to be brought in for instance, to resolve the 2017 funding cycle. By August 2018, there were still aspects of the 2017 student funding cycle that had to be resolved. And this had a knock-on effect on the 2018 uh, funding cycle. Some changes to the system at NESFAS during 2017, however, resulted in a relatively successful application phase for the 2018 cycle, with students applying directly to NESFAS in 2017, and many funding decisions were concluded by January 2018. In other words, the situation was not all that cloudy, despite these challenges I've outlined and the ones I'm going to outline also in the, in the, in the, in the next slide. But the rest of the process is at severe challenges. Now, the failure in 2018 that we were, we were faced with in the management of, of NESFAS was mainly due to the entity, as I have said, not doing enough to address the multiple system problems and inadequate business processes, which were already under strain in, in 2017. Although it was exacerbated by complexities that were introduced by the start of the rollout of new funding for poor and working class students announced in December 2017. In other words, Chair, the new bursary scheme of NESFAS was announced on the 16th of December 2017 to be implemented in January 2018. I don't think in future government we should ever do such a thing because you, you expect in two weeks, essentially, a whole new shift to administer, a whole new system that was actually very different. In fact, we were even lucky that we didn't have worse problems than what we, we actually had because there, is, there was no need for government to do that. And what was worse also in the introduction of that, much as it was a positive step that should be welcomed, is that the whole HEHA Commission and its report and recommendations was completely ignored. Some of the issues that this committee that I'm appointing have to deal with 
were covered quite extensively by many presentations to the HEHA Commission, by the way. And I will, I will expect this committee to go back also to look at the recommendations in the HEHA Commission that have got implications of ideas that were put in there by many stakeholders on how NESFAS could be managed better. I hope we don't go back to such a situation again, much as that was a very important announcement. Now, the effect of these then were very serious because as student funding cycle progressed in 2018, NESFAS was unable to finalize funding decisions and process payments to students, even at the late stage of the academic year. That was inevitable. We relied now once more on a system we we're trying to move away from that in 2018, we relied almost entirely on institutions to make payments to students. And many students remained unconfirmed and unfunded late in 2018. And there were multiple data and IT integration system problems at NESFAS, as I have already said. Of course, the root causes of these problems are multiple and complex and relate to problems in the area of business processes, policy controls, and staffing capacity. On the next slide, seven, the core problems relate to, but are not in, uh, restricted to an inadequate information technology architecture and system and business processes that are not fit for purpose and were designed without adequate consultation with and consideration of institutional systems. So that's why I was saying, I, I, I'm still very concerned as to why we, we early in the life of this department, we spent so much money for an IT system, but then later got so much exposed, even prior to 2018. With the introduction of substantial new student funding from government, along with a range of new policy considerations and taking into account the existing weaknesses in the entity, the challenges facing NESFAS in these areas became acute. This led to uh, my predecessor, Minister Pando, placing NESFAS under administration in August 2018 for an initial period of 12 months. And I had ex I've, I've extended that with another 12 months in August 2019 to August 2020. And I must say that one very positive outcome out of the process of administration is that the administrator has managed to lead a process that has further unearthed other problems that are faced in by NESFAS in terms of its administrative capacity and business processes. Although the 2019 student funding cycle was far better managed and there is evidence of significant improvements, some of the core problems that I've identified, they remain. Therefore, with this background, uh, as I said, uh, the Gazette is out. Honorable members, of course, are welcome and encouraged to look at it in some detail, but let me just highlight the key areas of investigation. That they must include an assessment of the enterprise architecture and business processes for the student centered model approved by the NESFAS board way back in 2012 to 2013. And this must include a full examination of the role and responsibilities of all role players in the model. A full review of the IT systems that support the NESFAS student centered model, and specifically the interface between the NESFAS information technology system and the IT systems at universities and colleges. This review must identify the critical issues that have led to the failure of the integration of data between NESFAS and institutions and make recommendations on the possibility of adaptation to automatically support data transfer. The Committee of Inquiry must make a determination on the extent to which the architecture of the NESFAS model is aligned with university and TVET college processes and IT systems, and what the gaps, challenges with the model may be. 
This point, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members, is one of the most important aspects in addressing the NESFAS business process. Because matters who have identified weaknesses in NESFAS' own internal IT and business processes, there is also the issue of institutions. That for NESFAS to be successful, much as NESFAS deals directly with students, you still need proper cooperation and coordination with institutions. In fact, we're consistently identifying that in a number of cases, sometimes the problems are not with NESFAS, but the problems are with institutions in terms of their capacity to supply data on time and sometimes even reliable data. Some of the issues we are reviewing now, for instance, surrounding N plus two, the application of N plus two, also have got to do with inaccurate or inadequate information being provided by institutions to NESFAS. Therefore, the committee, honorable members of the committee must be aware that this issue also of looking at the interface between NESFAS systems and institutional systems is an important matter. I don't have to tell you that because yourselves as the portfolio committee, we are dealing with some of these institutional weaknesses sometimes that affect even the, 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 the work that NESFAS is doing or may be doing correctly, as there are lots of those now, despite the challenges. The Committee of Inquiry, of Inquiry will also undertake a review of the findings and determination of the progress on the recommendations of all reports that have been undertaken by NESFAS between 2014 and 2020 to address systems and capacity deficiencies and as I have said, I'm also expecting that they reflect on the, 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 the recommendations of the HEHA Commission, especially those that relate to management and administration of NESFAS. Also, the inquiry, the, the committee will undertake a review of the system performance of NESFAS in relation to the 2018, 2019 and 2020 application processes for TVET college and university students in the light of the implementation of the new DHET Biosada scheme, including the assistance provided by the NYDA and other partners. Also, there must be a review of the approved processes set up for the NESFAS financial eligibility means test in view of the new DHET Biosada scheme for 2018-2020 application process and the implementation uh, thereof. Uh, on slide 10, the continuation of um, terms of reference mm -hmm. must include review of the suitability of mm -hmm. all displacement system, systems, investigation to the policies, controls and agreements in place at NESFAS identifying weaknesses and challenges, and this must include also all departments within NESFAS. The finance department at NESFAS, the human resources department, the ICT operations, and so on. There must also be a review of the organogram, the current job descriptions and skills requirements required to administer a future financial aid system. As you know, Honorable Chair, this is now a very big scheme which this year alone is going to be spending a huge operation. Also, I would like governance processes to be reviewed by the committee to ensure oversight of, of management of the entity, as well as assessing the roles and responsibilities and relationships between NESFAS and universities, as I have said, and TVET colleges. Then on the basis of these investigations, the committee then should make recommendations for improvements in all areas, as well as to advise on an appropriate model and processes for ensuring effective student funding support at universities and colleges. Now, that then constitutes uh, our input in response to the request by the Portfolio Committee on the first matter uh, of NESFAS. The second issue on slide 11, starting on slide 11, 
that we have been requested to report on is remuneration, the issue of the remuneration of vice chancellors. That has been legitimately raised by the committee, and which is a matter also that has been of concern to myself, by the way, uh, also against the backdrop of even the salary gap between your highest paid employee at our universities and the lowest paid workers as well. And often the gap between senior management at universities and, and, and academics, for instance. Now, <clears throat> you requested us last year, you requested me last year to look into this. And early in the year, then I wrote to the Council on Higher Education, the CHE, requesting them if they could conduct research on the matter and advise me accordingly. The terms of reference then of this process. I requested then the CHE should undertake research that should assess and or provide advice on the following. The annual data on the remuneration of vice chancellors and senior executive managers and annual salary, salary increases for the period covering 1994 to the present. Given the issue of data integrity limitations, the period has been reviewed and will start from 2005. Let me briefly explain why we are suggesting 2005. That prior to 2005, that was prior to the mergers. You know, the situation, in fact, was just carbon copy, just still reflecting the earlier apartheid era. And we hadn't undertaken any significant restructuring of the university landscape. And uh, there were all sorts of variations then. Not that they might be of interest research-wise for posterity, but if we are to really tackle this issue, we have to look at the new landscape and what has been happening from 2005. Uh, so that's that's the, the period, 2005 up to now, that this research is going to cover. In other words, the past 15 years. Also, uh, I expect the CHE to undertake comparison of salaries of vice chancellors and senior executive managers to those of academics, as I have said, and the rest of the non-academic staff. That period also is being reviewed uh, in the light of what I've just said above. Various administrative arrangements that exist to determine vice chancellor and executive salaries and whether remuneration committees rely on external salary benchmarks in determining vice chancellor's pay using a suitably constructed benchmark for each vice chancellor based on vice chancellor pay in similar institutions. For instance, one of the things that the portfolio committee is aware of is that also there is no real correlation between the size of an institution and the salaries of vice chancellors, or even maybe the type or nature of an institution and the salaries of vice chancellors. So that will have to be looked into as well as also various mechanisms for evaluating performance of VCs, relationship, that's on, on slide 13 now, relationship between vice chancellor's salary and an array of observable performance indicators, whether salaries of executives in the South African universities are comparable to salaries of executives in other countries with similar social economic contexts, and what is deemed appropriate levels of vice chancellors and senior executive managers? <coughs> Excuse me. Also to look into a consistent model by which remuneration should be calculated and benchmarked and the feasibility of a system-wide policy on the determination of salaries of executives, recognizing the important principle of institutional autonomy. Although I must say on this issue of institutional autonomy that 
Our legislation and policy framework, by the way, is clear that yes, we are for institutional autonomy, but with accountability. So it's not just institutional autonomy in abstract hanging in the air. It must be accompanied by accountability of these public institutions, which is a matter that will have to be considered uh, quite seriously. That's why it's appropriate that this matter be canvassed. Just an update then on what has happened further is that the chairperson of the CHE has already written to me twice to update me on the work which has commenced. And these are some of the updates is that following deliberations by the EXCO and the Council of the CHE, the Council has set up a task team led by the chair and comprising five members of the Council, the CEO and the CFO to oversee this project. A project initiation meeting involving the Council task team and officials from the department already has taken place and that was on the 8th of May. And the CHE has written to university councils of all our universities on the 11th of May to inform them about the objective, scope and processes of study and the nature of inputs expected from them and their respective institutions. By the 29th of May, the CHE had received positive responses from seven universities. On the 21st of May, the, the CHE task team held a courtesy meeting with the EXCO of USAF to brief them about the project, its background, and its plan of activities. The purpose was to solicit the buy-in of USAF into the project, and the meeting ended with a commitment by USAF to support the inquiry, which is very positive. Not that we wanted permission from USAF, but if we have the buy-in from USAF, it makes everybody's job easier. I must also say, by the way, Chair, that I intend to work to convene a meeting with all the chairpersons of councils of all our 26 universities to discuss with them a number of issues. Firstly, just what we are doing now in relation to COVID-19 and government's perspective and the department's approaches, because we've been dealing mainly with the vice chancellor as much as many councils are discussing this, but I thought it's important that I engage the chairpersons and the other matter that I will engage the chairpersons on, of course, will be to brief them about this process that I'm reporting on today on the salaries uh, of vice chancellors. On slide 15, the council met again on the 27th of May to consider various options for funding the project, appointment of a research assistant and consultants, and finalization of the terms of reference as well as the research instruments. The terms of reference activity plan and a concept note outlining the aims and objectives of the inquiry methodology to be employed, expected deliverables, and timelines <clears throat> have been developed. I have also requested the CHE to undertake as much of the inquiry from 1994 to the present, although I have said that the council wrote formally to me that uh, I should this should start in 2005 for reasons that I have outlined. Uh, the portfolio committee is welcome to reflect on that. Now, the next slide is the project plan. Well, members can go through that uh, because what this just outlined is that is the various stages uh, of the of the research project and what will happen at the different stages. Slide 17, uh, the CHE project plan is, is planned to run for 11 months. That I have agreed to and I had thought that it's a reasonable amount of time because there is a lot of work that will have to be done in the research and, and, and other <coughs> Uh, related uh, tasks and processes. A report presenting the research work undertaken and the findings will be completed, I expect, by the 31st of March next year. 
and an advisory submission on the feasibility of institutionalizing a system-wide policy on regulating remunerations of university executives and the implications uh, to be produced shortly after the 31st of March. On the next slide, what we are talking about here about the integrity of the process, because this is very important is that the Council of the CHE has assured me that the inquiry will be undertaken with the highest level of integrity in line with the relevant codes of ethics to ensure credibility of findings. And also that the task team overseeing the inquiry understands the sensitivities around this inquiry and will avoid making public statements about it during and after the inquiry. That would be my call. And of course, for, for Parliament to reflect on, on whatever would have come out. As well as also general queries about the inquiry will be for my office, since I'm the one who has commissioned the inquiry. And the CHE chairperson can only respond to issues relating to methodology and other technical aspects of the inquiry. That is where we are. Uh, chairperson on the second matter that you asked me to come and, and report about. Now, slide 19 then deals with uh, the, 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 the third issue, which is the missing middle funding issue. Uh, let me also just hear, uh, there are a few slides that I would like to talk to because this is a very important matter. I want to say that what, what sometimes maybe partly it's our own communication problem, what has not been clear or what has not been adequately outlined about the missing middle is that in 2016, whilst I was the minister, in my earlier stint as Minister of Higher Education and Training, 2016 I appointed a ministerial task team chaired by Mr. Sizwe Masa to develop a comprehensive funding and student support model for poor and missing middle students who require financial assistance to access public higher education and training system. I had made this decision after a fairly long process of attempting to find ways to respond to the National Development Plan proposal on student funding, which indicated that it is essential to do the following. And I quote from what the NDP says on page 325. To provide all students who qualify for the National Student Financial Aid Scheme with access to full funding through loans and bursaries to cover the cost of tuition, books, accommodation, and other living expenses. Students who do not qualify should have access to bank loans backed by state sureties. That's what the NDP says, which is what I was responding to when I appointed this ministerial task team in 2016. Now, of course, honorable members, I would really invite you, Chair, to, to, to go back and actually engage with this report. If need be, uh, I could ask one of the officials, if you so wish at some stage, to come and present this report to yourselves, just to properly refresh ourselves and for those members who might also not have been aware of this. But just to highlight some aspects from that report, the terms of reference, that I gave that ministerial task team in 2016 was uh, well, included the following. Whether or not the existing NESFAS Act structure and mandate is still suitable to address the funding and other forms of support to poor and missing middle students. Of course, uh, members must remember this was, this was before the 2017 announcement of a new bursary scheme now that's managed by ministers. But then at the time, also terms of reference included to raise sufficient funding, how to raise sufficient funding, I'd ask the task team to find out, from the public sector, private sector, and other sources 
to offer a complete solution to find to find poor and missing middle students at universities and private colleges. Also, uh, the feasibility of granting fully subsidized loans to poor students and loans with progressive reduction of subsidies as household income increases for the missing middle students. To explain this briefly, it's something that I think I have raised before in the, in the committee and in public, that as far as I'm concerned, no one should actually be denied a loan, an affordable loan, for higher education, irrespective of income, ideally. If you're earning 2 million, 3 million rents per annum, you should be given a loan, but possibly with a sliding scale in terms of interest that you pay back, that the more you earn, the more you pay, so that then those who are better off are able to support those who are not that better off. So I had asked the, 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 the task team to explore a model along those lines, also, the issue of the funding of occupations in high demand. Now, this matter, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members, is still a matter of importance for us as a country. Because as government, we know the nature and the extent of skills shortages. And therefore, ideally, our funding instrument whilst assisting the poor and the working class, or even the missing middle, should take into account of where we should actually be funding more in order to address the skills and balances that we have. This still remains a very crucial issue. At the moment, government policy on NESFAS, for instance, simply say you qualify if you meet criteria of mainly family income, and that's it. And we fund irrespective of field of study. And it's something that requires ongoing discussion and reflection upon because funding instruments should also be able to address the issue of skills priorities. I also had asked this task team to develop proposals which contribute towards the improvement of the success and graduation rates for poor and missing middle students and reduce dropout rates. Also, this is another issue that hasn't gone away. The issue of throughput and, and, and fader rates, although there's been an improvement, and our own research tells us that NESFA students perform on average better than non-NESFA students, but the issue of progression and throughput is still an, an issue. Also, I asked this team to create an efficient and robust model with appropriate internal controls to minimize leakage, fraud, and risk in the granting and dismissment of bursaries and loans to deserving students, whilst improving the collection of the loan portion granted and convenience to students. I must also say this, by the way, that I had also commissioned an investigation into corruption in the management and award of NESFAS, including at, at institutional level. Uh, prior to my departure in my role as Minister of Higher Education and Training in October 2017, I had actually, and I, I had been receiving periodic briefings from the investigation team that was uh, uh, doing this work. That's why some of the issues were being incorporated into the task team. Now, on the next slide, slide 21, is that, that this ministerial task team finalized this work and presented to me on the 10th of October 2016, its report. That ministerial task team recommended a blueprint for the funding model of the missing middle entitled the Igusasa Student Financial Assistance Program, in short called ISFAP. The blueprint recommended fully subsidized education for the poor in the form of bursaries and grants and progressively reducing bursaries 
and grants to the missing middle students as household income increases. It's the latter part that uh, the, the, the ISFA was dealing with in the main, uh, that's your missing middle, because the others now are catered for by NESFAS. Also, ISFAP or the report sketched scenarios on how this could be achieved using funds from both the public and private sectors through a PPP, public-private partnership model. The blueprint also proposed a range of key differences with the current NESFAS model, including the incorporation of a part focus on areas of high skills demand, a different approach to bursary loan combinations, exploring a different methodology in assessing household income, the inclusion of wraparound student support for funded students, a disbursement model utilizing the banking system, and legal amendments to allow the use of SARS for loan collection purposes. A range of other legislative amendments were suggested as necessary to make the proposed blueprint effective. Maybe let me just explain this paragraph a little bit, Chair, with your permission, because it's important to what we are trying to do now as the committee and as, as, as government. The one thing that is fun, the, mo the model we wanted to consider including was incentivizing students who are doing well, such that much as this was a loan, this would be a loan, but students who are doing well could have a portion of their loan converted into a bursary as part also of an incentive for students to do well, uh, which was a matter that I had asked them to look into. And also, by the way, it's something we had introduced for NESFAS, by the way, that we were also saying final year students who pass all their subjects would not pay back uh, their loans in terms of the old pre-2018 NESFAS model. So we were taking that partly from that model that we had, we had introduced. The wraparound was actually support to students. ISFAP was trying to get as close as possible to, to the model used by the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, SICA, in their bursary scheme. Their bursary scheme goes and so far the wraparound to assist students in order to ensure that they pass to even assigning mentors to the students including also giving some students holiday jobs when, when, when universities are closed so that they also get experience, which assists them to get further insight during their studies. Of course, it's a relatively expensive model, this. Whether a, a, a support, a scheme of this nature supporting the missing middle expanded would actually be able to cover, to go that far, is something that uh, will have to be considered uh, going forward. Slide 22 deals with what are really the funding issues for what we refer to as the missing middle. Now, using a household income cutoff, that was our calculation now around 2016, 2017, that missing middle actually goes up to 600,000. But of course, after the introduction of the new uh, qualification criteria uh, in 2017, in, starting in 2018, of NESFAS beneficiaries being those who come from families with a total household income of up to 350,000. So the, the, the category that actually, that we have, we have regarded as the missing middle, has been the category ending between, coming from families who earn between 351,000 rand per annum to 600,000 rands per annum. That is the kind of category we have been using as a guide as to who is the missing middle in South Africa today. That would be 2016, 2017 figures, of course. So using a household income then of this 600,000, the ministerial task team on the missing middle modeled the possible number of students and the estimated potential cost per annum of funding poor and missing middle students 
ranging from between 37 billion rands and 67 billion rands per annum, depending on the proportion of students funded. Now, of course, we can now do further research. But if I just take TUT, Tswana University of Technology, which I visited last week, they, when they gave us their figures, they said 55% of their students are NESFAS beneficiaries. And 40% of their students can be regarded as being in the missing middle. Perhaps 40% could be a reflection of the average across the system, that it could be around that, which now, in terms of our figures of 1.1 million students, is just over 400,000. Not very far from the university students we are funding through NESFAS. So it's quite a significant amount. The latest I've heard, I don't know, Dr. Parker may be able to hear to 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 add here, is that NESFAS, I mean ISFAP, sorry, at the moment is supporting about eight thousand students. If that's the case, that's minuscule given the, the scale, if the challenge is maybe at around 450,000. Of course, we will have to do uh, new calculations, also depending on the brackets that we would have to use. Now, the biggest contributor, of course, to the funding model of ISFA was private sector funding through incentives that were linked also to the broad-based Black Economic Empowerment Codes which was another innovative way in ISFAP, by the way, that the loans that were actually given would also benefit from BE accreditation as part of an incentive to the private sector to participate in the scheme. And possibly also using 25% of the 6% skills development expenditure by companies as a direct input to ISFAP. We were estimating that companies spent about 6% uh, on skills development of their total expenditure. Also, the other issue about the missing middle is that a legal and governance structure was also proposed for the blueprint by the ministerial testing on the missing middle. It must be noted that the proposed structure was also built on a strong perception in the private sector of a weakness first, which would not be able to garner the necessary support from the private sector, hence the new proposed structure of, of ISFA. The proposed structure would take the form of a public-private partnership between NESFAS, ISFA, and government. In other words, and this is another matter, Chair and Honorable Members, that still remains very important in our considerations now, which is why I'm going in a bit more detail on this, so that members have got a better appreciation, not just of the work done, but of the issues that were being canvassed, because most of them are still relevant uh, today. So what is very important was that we, we the task team had said, don't use NESFAS to find the missing middle, even if it would be a different scheme that is a public-private partnership. Rather, set up a separate scheme. Let NESFAS just focus exclusively to the children of the poor and the working class. So that was the model. Now, the MTT report, Cabinet, by the way, considered the draft report. I did present this report to Cabinet then which allowed the report to be published for public comment. And then some proposals were tested in 2017. The, the report was published for public comment on the 15th of December, 2016, and comments were received and analyzed. And this fed into the development of the model and into the feasibility study. The pilot was implemented in 2017 to test certain elements of the model with respect to students that were not able to access NESFAS at that time, those were above the threshold of 122,000, but below 600,000. However, during 2017, some NESFAS-supported students from participating universities were also included 
for top-up grants, remember the 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 earlier pre-2018 NESFAS model did not cover the full cost of study. So some NESFAS students were selected so that they could get an additional loan under the auspices as a top-up of uh, ISFAP uh, so that they also became part of the pilot. At the same time, a feasibility study was conducted. The work on both the pilot and feasibility study continued in 2018, by which time, though, substantial attention was focused on the rollout of the new DHET Bessel scheme and the challenges facing NESFAS. So in other words, this whole work was somehow overshadowed and overtaken by the new NESFAS Besser. Although I must say, Chair, for the record, because also history must, does not leave any spaces. I must say that in the, in the wake of the, uh, the, the processes leading up to the announcement of the new scheme, the Besser scheme for NESFAS, there were some who deliberately distorted what we were trying to do at the time, as if we were wanting to hand over NESFAS to the banks in the private sector. And there was absolutely no truth in that. All what we were trying to do is what I have just outlined with that ministerial task team. How do we deal with students who do not qualify for NESFAS? It was not trying to hand over NESFAS to the private banks. I just thought I need to correct that because that was deliberate distortion and disinformation that was making rounds and circulating in the PSET sector as if that we had an intention of privatizing NESFAS. So there was no such. Now, on slide 24 then, the pilot was conducted and Funds were raised from the private sector exclusively for his fund. The original intent was to address the feasibility of granting loans bursaries with progressively reducing subsidies as household income increases for the missing middle students. In other words, you would, if you so wish, not borrow for the whole hundred thousand rent that you've got to pay at VITS, but you could borrow a portion and subset and, and, and use that as a family, also your own income and so on. It could have been a mix of a number of things. In the original modeling, the ministerial task team assumed that government would cover full or part of the equity required to cover bad debt, but this assumption was not supported by the National Treasury, unfortunately, at the time. And that's the situation now unless and that until it changes. I must also just add my own view at the moment uh, that indications point out that a significant section of students from the missing middle come from families of public servants. Think about it, Chair. This is not very well researched. It's just anecdotal based on also what you know. If a, 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 I think that at the moment, a, an assistant deputy director may just qualify for NESFAS if he or she is the sole breadwinner in the family. But deputy directors definitely do not qualify. Directors do not qualify and going up. Now, an assistant deputy director is not a head of a well-earning or wealthy person when it comes to supporting someone at university in particular. Because of that, I have also been of the view that the PIC needs to be drawn in to be part of establishing any kind of public-private support scheme for the missing middle. But these are issues that I would like that they be considered going forward. But not only that. You know, Honorable Chair, research tells us now that 
pension and provident funds in South Africa today are worth 12 trillion rands. 12 trillion rands. Now, I find it hard to believe that with so much money, of course, which must not be wasted, we can't afford to have an affordable and viable loan scheme supported by these funds for about half a million students. I find it hard to believe that it can be the case. A lot of creativity is needed and innovation, and I believe that things are possible. Those are some of the things we may have to look into going forward. Also, I must say that in addition from funding from the private sector, uh, which was in the form of donations, sorry, in addition to funding from the private sector, in the form of donation, donations to support the pilots, uh, only grants were provided uh, in the pilot. ISFAP noted that based on the feasibility study and the engagement with the National Treasury, a loan-based system would be very difficult without government support. That's an important consideration. Although, of course, government support now is, is for poor and working class students. On slide 25, outlines the reasons why a loan-based system could not be implemented without government support. Because in all the modeling done, the bad debt, capital repayment, and capital interest was always bigger than the repayments and interest paid by the students. The student loan model direct to students requires a constant injection of equity in order to break even. We are not saying in future such a scheme can't break even. But in its first five years or so and, and so on, it will need quite strong backup. Also, it couldn't succeed without government support because any non-profitable element in a public-private partnership would not be accepted as a PPP. It would be problematic also to use any of the grant funding to service the bad debt resulting on loans without putting the Section 8A tax status of the grant vehicle that is at risk. Those are the technicalities around financial considerations. An entity can only borrow from commercial markets after they built up a track record. At the time, we assessed of about seven years, and even then the track record would need to look positive. Any negativity or issues of this track record may adversely affect the possibility of borrowing. Now, continuing then on, on, on 2016, ISFAP has continued, where ISFAP is now, has continued as a private grant provider, given that loans could not be provided based on the reasons outlined above. So it's there, as far as government, who have taken a back step from it, though it was our initiative to explore the feasibility of funding the missing middle. And ISFAP has continued to focus on scar skills and supporting poor working class and missing middle students. ISFAP does not provide a universal solution to issues of missing middle funding. We must be clear about that as it stands now and is continuing now to operate as a private bursary provider or loan provider and a, com or a combination of those, as I have said. The DHT is working with National Treasury and DPME to look at alternative models. This work takes into account the work of the MTT, the pilot and feasibility study, the implementation of ISFAP as a private bursary provider, and the recommendations of the HEHA Commission, particularly the proposal relating to an income contingent loan model. I must say, on my part as minister, I've just started exploring uh, some advice uh, that could actually even help that I guide the department better on what could be done from people who are knowledgeable. For instance, I have just initially been engaging with some, uh, I will formally, once I formalize this, I will report about it, just to say informally, can you make an assessment quick? Is there an appetite in the private sector to participate in this? 
today, if there is an appetite, what would it require for us? The fact of the matter is that the big four banks, from the look of things, have no appetite for such. I need to say that, Chair, just in terms of my latest assessment, just being advised informally on the side, although I would like to formalize that advice, the one bank that had a huge appetite folded, which was the African bank, it went through business rescue, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure, it's coming back now. And uh, there are new banks also, we don't know. The smaller ones, you have got Capitec, we have got Time Bank, amongst others, there may be others, you know, may not have shown any interest, but I'm not saying that they wouldn't. Uh, because that's why also we, we need to be looking at, by the way, outside of, of government funding, which at the moment has prioritized your next first beneficiaries. So all those are things that going forward we will actually have to, to look into. This work also will need to take into account the substantial changes in the student finding environment since 2018. Also the student debt issues in the system and the many other demands on state funding for higher education and training. Like for example, postgraduate funding support as well as the fiscal context. And the fiscal context we are in now if truth be, to be, to be told, is far worse than the fiscal context we were in when I commissioned the study of the missing middle in 2016. In fact, there's been a sea change now with COVID-19 also. And as the president was answering questions yesterday, you know, highlighting, you know, the damning, I mean, not the damning, but the, 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 the reality of potential job losses and negativity on the impact and on resources of government, we will have to take that into account. On slide 27, in the long term, the department is working towards a comprehensive student financial aid model or ecosystem that addresses the funding needs of all the students who require financial assistance and also takes into account postgraduate funding. This may include a combination of bursary and loan models. It is, it is unlikely that this can be done without a substantial additional investment of funds from government. NESFAS and the department funding for poor and working class students is clearly a central part of this financial aid model. It is possible that ISFAP, if it continues in its current form, could also be one part of a financial aid system along with other private sector and non-profit funders. I'm clear in my own mind that we will still have to go back as we further explore this question to engage ISFAP and just to see the latest situation and what's going on there. Is there a possibility? Now, Chair, because I've taken a long time, let me just slide 28, 29, and 30. Let me just be very brief. Because the issue of student debt, I just want to say that government in recent years has twice offered relief to students under the old, who are in the old NESPAS pre-2018 scheme, funding relief. Now, there has been a matter that has been in the public, which, by the way, and unfortunately, uh, Honorable Nodada and Honorable Pozzoli, I took issue with the DA because I found that the DA statement was very reckless in misinterpreting my answer to them as if government is committing to a 1.9 billion rands relief to historic debt. And there's no such. It was the past historic debt and the Auditor General has raised, had raised queries about how that money was categorized to justify its spending. There was no new commitment by government to do that. But then I just got flooded, you know, by the media, saying the Democratic Alliance is saying we are going to be providing new debt. So there is no such. I just want to clarify that. Not that we are not concerned about student debt as government, we are concerned. That is why government has introduced a bursary scheme now. 
Because strictly speaking, the students who are now being funded from 2018 are not accumulating any debt because they are virtually fully funded. Now, we are, we are also, by the way, doing targeted, I must say this, Chair, targeted interventions to provide relief where possible to students now who are still in the pre-2018 NESFAS 122,000 loan scheme. 122,000 For instance, what we are doing now, we are looking at students who are doing final year who are about to complete, who are owing. That those students at least should be assisted in one way or the other as much as possible. It might not be debt relief, but it might be saying, well, sign a new debt form so that you actually are able to complete. Even those who are outside the N plus two is something now that we are looking at to say, if we are completing and you are left with few more, more modules, rather we say sign a debt recognition and then we allow you to complete and be out of the system. So also we are dealing with the matter of N plus two, where students have been unfairly discriminated against. There are 9,000 now who have appealed I've asked NESFAS to go through all those 9,000 appeals and where students have been unfairly discriminated will pay for that. For example, a student who decided to deregister in March, just around the start of the academic year, for whatever reason, can't be counted therefore as having finished a full year and therefore has met the requirements of the number of years that should be spent on the program. Some of the students fell ill, genuinely so, and where there is proof of that, we want to actually address that particular, those particular problems. So that was the issue. Let me not then go into the detail of that. You can look at that yourselves, because I'm worried now about time, although I don't know how I could have dealt with these issues shorter than the period uh, that. But what I want to say, on slide 31, is that the overall debt of students in the university system is currently estimated at approximately 11 billion rands. Of course, this includes students who are not funded by NESFAS, as well as NESFAS students where their debt had not been cleared. This issue of student debt is a challenge for the country even globally, by the way, in, 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 in countries that do not have adequate means to support students, it's a big issue. In fact, in the United States, prior to COVID-19, uh, research was showing that this was possibly the single item of debt that was could even threaten to become a precursor to another, another meltdown, the issue of student debt. And also on that slide 31, we are saying there are also students who have re-entered the university system who may or may not have been funded by NESFAS in the past who are carrying historic debt and are now funded by NESFAS. We are investigating the quantum of historic debt of this group of students. The last slide, Chair, having had a consultation that informally with you yesterday, I think that what we've written here is somehow at variance with what the committee had asked. The committee had not asked to standard that we standardize SRC elections insofar as holding them at the same time or in exactly the same way. The committee had asked us, which is what is something that we, uh, uh, Dr. Parker we must go back and do, to actually come up with a framework for holding of SRC elections such that there are certain standards that are maintained across the board so that also we protect the credibility of the elections and also minimize disruptions around SRC uh, elections. The issue of student leadership development, we are still committed to exploring, uh, to give some support as the department because we think it's important for students to actually receive this. We had introduced this around 2014, 2015. Unfortunately, it was overtaken by this fees must fall protest such that it fell away. As a department, we still think that students do need to be supported, both at institutional level as well as 
at macro level student leadership training, which is important. Chairperson, I wish I could be shorter, but uh, what you had given us was quite substantial amount of work to do, and I didn't want to do an injustice. Thank you very much. And uh, let, let me say, Chair, sorry that the, my officials are accompanying me, who then, depending on the nature of the questions that I'm asked, some of the more detailed or technical questions, I may refer to them uh, to be able to, to answer them. But I'm here to engage with the portfolio committee. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Minister. For the for the responses, I think <clears throat> you did well to the issues that we gave you to respond to. Uh, you had one and a half hours, so uh, you still had about eight minutes to conclude your presentation because the one and a half hour is going to be uh, dedicated to the engagements. So, but thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Can I get an indication from members? I saw the hand of Honorable Bozoli, who had indicated that she will be leaving at 11. So maybe let's start with her. Is there any other member who would like to engage? You must raise a hand there. <clears throat> Uh, Honorable Notada, uh, Mananiso, uh, Kietze, uh, Litsie, Litsie. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, those are the the members who would like to to engage. It looks like there is a problem. Uh, others are able to raise their hand on the system. Others are not able to do that. Professor Bozoli was able to raise her hand, but other members says they will not. They are not able to do that. I think uh, the system is still under development uh, so that all the members can be able to raise their hands and perform all the functionalities that the system allows. But otherwise, we have got uh, five members who are going to engage. Uh, let's start with Honorable uh, Bozoli. Can we ask uh, Dr. Parker to stop sharing the presentation with us? so that we can be able to get into the discussion and members can be seen on the screen. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Bozoli. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, just to let you know that I couldn't see the, the, the presentation throughout the entire thing, so just for IT information. But I did look at it on my own uh, computer, so... Um, just to say thank you very much, um, Minister, for your presentation. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear your uh, frank and, and open um, uh, way of doing things. Uh, much appreciated. Um, the first thing is just to say we welcome your task team, um, headed by Eunice Ballam, who we think will be an excellent um, leader of the task team. Um, and also we welcome the, um, the VC's salary investigation because we think there are some quite serious anomalies there that, that need looking into. Um, but talking about the student funding, um, you know, basically what you seem to be saying is that student funding is unaffordable. Um, you, you can't afford to extend the funding model to the missing middle. And um, even though you had this very worthwhile investigation in the earlier times, those were times when there was more money about. There isn't any money about. And Minister, I really don't think it's appropriate to stop eyeing the PIC and pensions and provident funds um, in order to, to fund students. 
Um, every single department in government is going to be eyeing those funds, and it's very important that this not happen, um, and um, that government starts to realise it has to cut back on its funding rather than spend more. And in respect of that, I'm just wondering whether the whole NISFAS scheme, which was from the beginning not sustainable and was always too expensive for uh, a poor country like us, needs to be looked at and the whole thing needs to be rescaled and perhaps scaled down slightly because we just can't afford this and we'll never be able to fund the missing middle, um, either out of private sector funds or out of the PIC or out of pensions. This will not happen. Um, and um, something drastic has to be done in this and in many other areas of government. My last point is about our um, statement that we made that the minister was rightly, I must say, um, irritated by because we, we claimed that funds were being um, written off when the um, NISFAS people had explained to us at a meeting that I think I was not able to attend for medical reasons, that they weren't being written off, but they were being, um, you know, some other thing was being done with those funds. I apologize for the incorrect statement, but I do want to read to you the answer to a parliamentary question that the department gave when I asked um, what amount of the 7.8 billion of irregular expenditure uncovered at the National Student Financial Aid Scheme? Um, it has been cleared, remains to be cleared, and um, what is the timeline for clearing that irregular expenditure? And under one section, it says here, shifting of earmarked funds, historic debt, 1.9 billion, and then it says in the last column, in the process of being written off. So I think we could be excused for thinking that meant that 1.9 billion rand of historic debt was being written off. And in the absence of the broader explanation of that, um, I think we can be forgiven for having made an error. But I am sorry that that error caused the department a lot of um, inconvenience. So just to explain that, that it was perfectly well intentioned. It came out of a question that we had asked and you had answered and um, the misunderstanding really is is actually understandable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Pozzoli, and thank for your uh, for your apology. I think uh, the minister has uh, listened to that. I think that's what the minister had wanted. <laughs> uh, or you will be pleased with. <clears throat> Can we get Honorable Notada? Thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, am I audible, Chair? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Minister, but thank you. What are you It's not parliamentary, that cap. Are you allowed uh, to chambers wearing that cap? <laughs> no, uh, Chair. It's just this thing of uh, uh, not having something in uh, there. But okay. it's not an issue. Um, thank you so much uh, to the minister. I think uh, the presentation was very comprehensive and very informative. And I think uh, uh, the Honorable Pizzoli has touched on the fact that we appreciate in particular the, the gazettement of the um, ministerial task team on uh, the NSPS, reviewing the NSPS business model. And I think it's something that we've been raising quite consistently, um, and Minister, if you would remember, when we're requesting that NSFAS be completely overhauled. So uh, that gives us a lot of confidence uh, moving forward. I just have uh, uh, particular questions on uh, the, the task team, um, the missing middle, and uh, maybe just one question on, on the SRC portion of the presentation. But I wanted to check, uh, Minister, if there is a, a project plan um, for the allocated time frame for investigation when it comes to uh, NSFATS um, and whether there's work that has commenced regarding that. And then secondly, as we may know, that the administrator uh, at NSFATS's uh, term ends on the 31st of August. And there has been an indication that um, the work of, of uh, 
the investigation has been given a time frame of six months, which uh, obviously overlaps um, in terms of um, the end of term of the administrator. Um, can you just indicate uh, what um, the implications of that would be and, and, and how would things work moving forward uh, when it comes to MSFAS? And then lastly, having read the, the, the terms of reference in terms of what needs to be investigated in terms of the NSFAS business model, would you not agree that um, at least we need to also consider uh, as part of the portion that talks about the disbursement of allowances uh, to investigate what the possibility would be at least uh, to review the TVET allowances in comparison to university allowances maybe specifically on accommodation um, and food um, because you would find i'll give you a practical example and i see one of the, the, the members on the trust team is a principal at the pet vet college if you're a student at pet vet college for example and you're a student at nelson mandela university you are most likely to be accommodated in the same off-campus residence uh, minister meaning that the cost of that would be the same, even though you are uh, in two different institutions, one being a TVET and one being a university. And I think it's something that we can maybe put a lens to when we do review the business model at NSFAS and how we deal with the disbursement of allowances or the allocation of allowances, which is maybe a gap that I would have, I, that I had picked up um, uh, in terms of a term, terms of reference, if we can maybe give comment to that. And then around the missing middle, um, I think you have made a comment and, and made a comparison around um, um, an, an estimate saying that maybe there could be 40% of missing middle students in our institutions. But I think it would be wise for us to maybe get um, a full report or a breakdown as to how many students are actually missing middle students in our institutions. Um, and then uh, maybe take it from there. Uh, I don't know if the Hair Commission maybe had done the investigation of that nature before uh, and, had, and had come up with a recommendation. But I would obviously like to hear uh, your views in terms of that. And then the second last question on the missing middle and historic debt. Um, is the policy plan put in place for us addressing the issue of funding for the missing middle? Because if, if you remember, when we did pose the question to NSFAS, um, when they came to present the APP and the department came to present the APP, there was no indication of um, a policy for the missing middle, whether there are time frames, there were no targets for that. Can you maybe give an indication on whether there is a policy plan put in place? Are there time frames for it? Um, and whether there will be targets set uh, so that we can mon measure the performance uh, of, of the department in terms of that. And then um, lastly, uh, on, the, on the missing middle and historic debt, um, there, there seem to have been a discrepancy uh, if maybe um, we can just get an under understanding that um, in a meeting in March 2020, um, it was reported there that um, it was 910 million um, that uh, was uh, claimed for the historic debt. But then again, we got another different figure of 885 million. Uh, based on the amount, the, the money that was approved previously to clear historic debts, and I understand why that why there's a discrepancy on that. If we can maybe get a, a clarification, and then my last question, chair, is on the SRC. Um, I think we've raised this previously in our portfolio committee meetings, and I, I personally have experienced it uh, on the ground as well, having visited these institutions, um, particularly TVETs that don't allow or don't want the presence of uh, uh, student political organizations on their campuses, the way they run uh, SRC elections is not standardized. Uh, and in some instances, it's just people being co-opted just to comply with the Higher Education Act to ensure that each institution has an SRC. And I think we need to get a report whether each institution has a student representative council and an SRC constitution that guides that um, so that we can see whether they comply in terms of making sure that the student representation um, in, the, in the statutory committees of each uh, institution to make sure that students are represented in terms of that. And then lastly, has there been a, 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 a investigation 
uh, Minister, on what would cost if we were to standardize SRC elections and them being run by the IEC, even though that we know that the IEC get uh, you know, caught up in doing the work of local and national uh, elections and therefore they can't be available. But obviously they would obviously make recommendations as to who can run those elections based on their standardized uh, uh, stipulated uh, criteria. So has there been an investigation on that and how much would it cost if there has been an investigation on that? Thank you so much, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, Honorable Nodada. Um, can we get Honorable Mananiso? Comrade Jane, Honorable Mananiso, are you there? Thank you, Chairperson. I'm here. Okay. Let me firstly welcome the pre the presentation by the let's, uh, let's minister. See, Actually, let's see your face, uh, Honorable Mananiso. Okay. All right. Okay. Can <laughs> okay. <proceed? laughs> yes. I, I'm, I'm saying let me firstly welcome the presentation by the minister. And one must say that I'm very happy about the uh, MTT uh, based on the fact that I've scrutinized the CVs and I can tell that these people are fit for purpose. And what I want to comment on is the, is the issue of communication. To say, Minister, moving forward, you would need to strengthen that part as a department so that you minimize opportunism that you would get people going outside saying something that is con contrary to what you, you want to achieve as a department. Uh, Chairperson, I want to as well welcome the fact that uh, the ministers even tasked them to actually look on the ways or, or mechanism to actually uh, appreciate those who are best performers, uh, best performing uh, students, because at times, we like to do this so that we motivate those who are beneficiaries in our system. So I openly welcome this part so that it can even improve those who are trying to uh, do well uh, on their studies. Lastly, Chair, we must acknowledge the fact that uh, this time the minister is working the talk. Uh, it's no longer like before that... Uh, he would promise this and do something else. And uh, we really appreciate the fact that he has noted that for us to move this department forward, we need creativity and innovation. So thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Manani. So uh, the next uh, person to ask a question will be Honorable Gates. Fighter kids Hello. in the Hello. house. Yes. Okay. Am I Over. There? Yes. Look, thank, thank, thank you so much, Shepherdson, for the opportunity. And maybe today we won't have two minutes to deal with these issues. And also appreciate the presence of the minister. Well, I want to start with the fact that minister, if you remember, on the 11th of May. 2009, we, some of us, we, we were quite happy with your appointment by the former president, Jacob Zuma, that you will be finally leading the, the higher education. We were jubilant, you know. We, we had that hope that at least someone would ordinarily understand the struggles of the working class is finally leading that particular uh, important uh, ministry or rather portfolio. We, 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 we really, we were... We were hopeful to be to be honest with you. Now, when you look at majority of those people who were appointed at that time, you remained one of the few ministers that served almost 10 to 11 years in that particular uh, ministry or department. Now, <coughs> excuse me, when we were to be honest and to reflect uh, in terms of the performance and really the things that the, your own uh, uh, department have achieved. I mean, you are going to agree with a lot of young people out there who are calling for your resignation or for your removal. Uh, because honestly, I mean, when you, we, we, we were to be honest, we start with what you were raising right now of the 100 million you approved of the IT system that was supposed to deal with challenges 
of NSFAS that we were facing at that time. And only to learn that recently, the very same system couldn't assist anyone with anything. In fact, it, the NSFAS is using the same system, but we are told that the system is well reintegrated. But NSFAS continue to use the very same system you are saying it had failed. The very same system that led to the dismissal of Mr. Nasana and his, uh, his, uh, his team uh, at NSFAS. The very same system. It is the same system that continue to fail our students today in all institutions of higher learning. So I thought I should give that background, uh, Comrade Minister, to, to, to show you where you are coming from. And we haven't forgotten that when uh, Jacob Zuma uh, appointed you, it was something that we thought uh, it is uh, uh, one of those appointments that will change uh, our lives for better because of we thought your understanding of our struggles is much more inclined than many other comrades at that time. Now, I'm going to move to the second aspect of my concern. And it's one thing that we have raised, I think, yesterday with Tibet colleges. The infrastructure grant, well, the infrastructure innovation grant, or I, I don't know how you normally refer it, I mean, call it, the one, the grant that you normally give to colleges and universities to improve their infrastructure. We haven't seen much happening, to be honest, especially in colleges. Because every time when we speak about the challenges of colleges and their dilapidating infrastructures, we are consistently being told that no, we are building new uh, campuses and, and so forth and so as if those that are existing are supposed to just dilapidate and rot the way they are continuing. So we do not know the, the, the like where are these funds going to because they are supposed to be assisting uh, with, I mean, assisting colleges with improving their infrastructure, your, 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 your Wi-Fi connectivity, your, your, the, them having better uh, uh, cyber centers and libraries. So those are the kind of the things that we do not really need this infrastructure grant to deal with. But as it stands, we do not know where is that money essentially going to. On the following aspect, well, I'm, go I'm going to move quite quicker to the next item which is the online learning. And I thought we would perhaps look into it and see if to this point it has been effective or not. And I'm convinced that the majority of the people that we from day to day interact with, they have uh, continued to experience problems with uh, learning on online. It is a problem that we, we think we should look into and not just uh, you know say no, but we are we are dealing with, we are saving lives and saving the academic year at the same time. We must not compromise one okay. or the other. We must always be uh, cognizant of the fact that lives matter. But at the same time, when we succeed, we must not leave a gap, Comrade Chairperson. Okay. I'm done. We are not dealing with online learning today. Oh, okay. okay. No, thanks. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Can't... Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Pizier. I'm not done, Chairperson. I was just oh, you're not done. You. Okay. So I thought you said you are done. No, no. I was, okay. I was, I was removing online because I thought it was okay. something urgent. No, that's that fine. Continue. Removing Rapper. online. And as far as privatization, I had Minister echoing sentiments to say there's a, there were other forces to say, though now the government wants to privatize and as far as and, and, and all that. Maybe the, the question will go directly to the minister to check the role of the banks themselves. I mean, today the banks are the ones who are administering the entire budget of NSFAS to, dis to disperse it to students. They're the ones who are central, I mean, who are distributing that money. And, and, and as a result, they are going to be the ones who benefit more than anyone else because they're the ones who... Uh, uh, you know, uh, distributing these funds. I mean, after <coughs> so much fight, struggles, and students getting arrested, the banks comes with the, you know, out of the fruits of student activists, banks comes and become the one who administer the fight that students fought very vigorously on the street. But it's a discussion of another day, perhaps a discussion of a need to, 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 to you know, fast track the implementation of a state bank. So that this kind of, uh, you know, transactions are, you know, uh, uh, primarily dealt with.
by the state bank. The N2 rule quickly. With the N2 rule, I think we also need to interrogate its uh, implications, this thing within our student community. Because I have I have, I have, I have diagnosed a sense of, you know, aloofness from our understanding of how student community operate. When you look at, you know, how management, even officials from the department, often refer to the student activists to fail, that you comrade, you fail, you have been here for, for seven years, for a course of four years, and, and so forth and so forth. And now this N2 rule seemingly it's like, it's some sort of an ammunition aimed at student activists. And we're making a mistake thinking that it is only student activists who find themselves in that particular situation. <coughs> it's many students, given uh, 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 many circumstances, they <coughs> then uh, suffer from that. Lastly, Minister, maybe you can check with the University of Free State. They have deregistered students who were on NSFAS. Today, as I speak, those students are being told that they are no longer using NSFAS. They, 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 in fact, they must be able to pay whatever money that the NSS have uh, previously paid for their fees. I think it's also something that needs attention of this committee and your department. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Honorable Casey. Uh, Honorable Litsia. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. I think we must also welcome the presentation from the minister on the department at large. I think on the terms of reference of the committee, we also need a minister to include the part where we must look at both uh, transport, schools, and residence allowances for Tibet students, um, uh, who may be NSFAS beneficiaries. Because our, our kids at this, at this uh, uh, Tibet colleges, uh, college, colleges are given way less than what um, they should, in my view, uh, because uh, for food allowance, uh, university students are giving almost double what uh, these ones are giving. In fact, more than double if you include residence allowance. And this, uh, these learners, they buy the same food from the same stores. Um, so I think maybe let's also include this part there. Uh, maybe put a note also that says uh, specifically for this, yeah, but they should, the committee must report back uh, earlier than, um, you know, the six months. I think if they can do that, it will give you guys an opportunity in the department uh, to start a process of assisting them for 2021 financially. Because if we were to follow this one, uh, you, the, the six months will end on the 21st of November, it's probably report to you guys or give you a report you must still uh, finalize the report you'll probably get a report in general or federal next year um, and it might be too late for uh, this uh, specific court of students the Tibet sector uh, to be assisted for 2021 uh, academic year two minister when you started the presentation or during the course of the, the presentation you have more than once uh, mentioned that NSPAS has spent hundreds of millions of rents on IT system. In fact, uh, I joined the meeting late because I could not um, join because of, uh, I don't know what was wrong with teams, but uh, after I joined, I had to say that twice. So it might be uh, more than uh, twice. So and we keep hearing, uh, we also said it now, we also keep hearing that IT systems at NSFAS are not adequate uh, enough to deal with the problems there. Why is that the case? And what oversight role has the department played in ensuring that there is value for money on this IT system? Uh, number three, 
um, your new 2019-2024 MTS uh, commits your department to developing a sustainable model uh, for missing legal funding, missing legal student funding. Uh, when are you uh, envisaging that um, you know you are going to implement this uh, this model? I uh, just need time time frames on this one, uh, Minister, because sometimes we, we we come up with very good innovative suggestions. Uh, but because we don't put our, we don't put time frames, we end up not having. Um, and so I think, Chairperson, because on other issues, I know you guys will come up, but I just need that clarity on the issue of funding for, um, uh, but again, not funding, uh, clarity for on uh, uh, remuneration of vice chancellors. Um, um, you know what? What exactly are we? Yeah, you have muted yourself. Eh? You have muted yourself. Okay, yes, yeah. Sir. Okay. Yeah, I think those are the few 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 things a few things Chairperson, that I um, 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 needed to speak about. Maybe uh, ISFAP uh, end up uh, lastly on ISFAP. Uh, we are told that it, it's now a, a private funding scheme, uh, although it was established through the ministerial task team. Uh, how will the department ensure that uh, this is ISFAP thing uh, comes back to the department? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. The last. Uh member to engage with the presentation is uh, Honorable Boshoff. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, just one uh, short thing before I start with what I actually want to say. Uh, I was surprised to, uh, to hear from Honorable Kietzi that the EFF was overjoyed with something the government uh, did I think uh, that's something you will always just hear afterwards because I wouldn't guess it at the uh, at the stage. And uh, about the uh, presentation of the minister, what, what are you also... saying, Pocho? What are you saying? <laughs> what are you saying? Hey, which, order, order. Which we also welcome. I once, uh, when the minister uh, told us about the reopening of the of the higher education sector. I said, well, that's a that's a type of communist to love. Um, regarding the uh, funding of uh, students in any uh, income level, I just want to ask uh, what happened to the idea um, of students just studying with bursaries from, let's say, state owned enterprises, private businesses, mines, um, and so on, to, to what extent? Uh, does that still happen? Um, regarding higher education, I have a little bit of a gap in the sense that it uh, it interested me when I was a student, and then it started me to it started to interest me once again when my children uh, started going to university, and it uh, suddenly became very um, uh, acute to me to know how to to uh, uh, you know to pay all these uh, enormous accounts. When I was at university, most of my, my friends studied with uh, bursaries from ESCOM, ESCOR, um, the Arms Corps affiliates, uh, or even some state departments, or even some municipalities who granted uh, bursaries. Um, also, uh, uh, bank loans was uh, prevalent at that stage, while the minister now informed us that banks seem to have no appetite at all which actually seems funny because uh, granting loans is a business of, of banks and maybe they don't have the, uh, the, the confidence in the future of South Africa, the economic uh, future of South Africa, that they will be repaid, let's say, in the uh, 10, 15 years after the student has uh, completed his uh, uh, studies. Uh, the, the, the whole idea uh, that funding of uh, study should not be just the state's responsibility, I think that's 100%. Um, it, it should be a, a, a collective effort. And it is to me as if the state 
actually wants to take more initiative than is appropriate. I, I would like uh, to hear the minister's uh, comment on that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, Honorable Boshov. Um, you are the last, so I just want to make some couple of comments and questions, and then we'll hand over to the minister. <clears throat> um, I think firstly, just to thank the minister uh, for coming to address the committee on those issues that we requested uh, him to come and address us on. Uh, you must bear with us, uh, Honourable Minister, for having insisted that you must. we must have this engagement. Uh, we know that we had to postpone it for a couple of, uh, on a couple of occasions, either because of unavailability, either because of uh, the programme of, uh, of Parliament, which is uh, very unpredictable nowadays, uh, keeps on changing. Uh, but finally, we are happy and glad that you are with us. I think given the quality of the presentation that you have given us, and uh, all of all members, I think, are quite appreciative of that fact. And uh, it just demonstrates that your availability today was necessary to engage on these quite critical issues. And, and I think we need to, to see this thing in the context of a government which is responsive, because when I look at most of the issues, I mean, for instance, let's just take the issue of the remuneration of vice chancellors. <clears throat> it's quite a, a controversial issue out there it's quite a sensitive issue when it comes to yourself, but it's a matter that you are great with us that it's worth pursuing. And uh, you have, uh, as we requested you, you have uh, assigned Commission on Higher Education to, uh, to do this research. So for me, I think it demonstrates the responsiveness on the part of government to follow up the issues that uh, are raised by the stakeholders, including Parliament. <clears throat> so we are on the same page in as far as that is concerned, Minister. We, I must say that we are very happy with the establishment of the, uh, is it the Committee of Inquiry for NS, NSFAS? I think it's welcomed. Uh, <clears throat> It's welcome that we have that committee to look into the model and the architecture of uh, NSFAS and come with recommendations. Uh, so we we are almost on the same page on most of the issues that uh, we requested you to come and brief us, uh, Honorable Minister. Just just on the question of the missing middle, I think. Uh, it's important to appreciate the background, which some of us were not having that background of where the matter comes from and where it is now. <clears throat> and I think it helps uh, in looking at the matter of the of the missing medley. Uh, you know, when we had an engagement with yourself, Honorable Minister, early this year, I think it was, was it early this year or last year? When we were engaging with the stakeholders uh, just before the commencement of the 2020 academic year, I think it was this year. <clears throat> One of the issues that uh, you make a, made a public commitment on was to try and find a solution to the funding challenge of the missing middle. Uh, I, I don't know whether Minister remember we met at uh, CSIR uh, early this year. Uh, and I think that uh, it's important that we, 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 you pursue that. You pursue a solution to this funding crisis because almost 400,000 estimated is quite a, a large number of students will require funding for them to pursue their studies. 
But I think also uh, something that needs to be done, and I'm not sure whether it has been done, uh, is to assess or probably even to consolidate and quantify uh, all the funding by public entities to students who are at universities. You have got a large number of uh, public entities that are funding students at universities. You've got the CITAS, almost all the CITAS have got some funding program for students who are studying at universities. You've got the NYDA, you've got many other public institutions that are funding. And you may find that it is the market that they are targeting the medicine medley. So in fact, if you may quantify, if you can do a proper research around how many of them are receiving, you may find that that number of 400,000 estimated, it's uh, the bulk of it is receiving funding from uh, uh, the public state, the state through various public entities. So I don't know whether that has been done, but I think uh, if you can engage in that exercise, you may find that uh, actually the problem may not be as big as we think that it is. But I would like to urge the minister to continue uh, looking at this matter. The state must initiate, the state must not, I don't think we, we are calling for the state to bear the, the responsibility on the cost of uh, funding the missing military, but I think the state must begin an initiative that will seek to address this problem. Because at the end of the day, the state is responsible for the education of its nation. And those who have will obviously pay for the, for the education. Those who don't have, there must be other means of assisting those in order to increase the pool of knowledge uh, in the country. Otherwise, thank you very much. Uh, Comrade Minister, over to you. Chairperson, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps with your permission, uh, can, can I just allow uh, Aruna, our DDG for Tivet Colleges, acting DDG, uh, as well as Dr. Parker, to, to, to be the first one just to pick up on a number of issues, some of which are a little bit more detailed and technical, to actually comment on. They must feel free to actually comment on any of those issues. And then I come in at the end. Would that be okay, Chair? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. All right. Okay. Aruna? Aruna is struggling. Maybe Dr. Parker first. Aruna may come in if she's still struggling later. Aruna is Dr. Thank Parker. You. Thank you, Minister. Um, perhaps I, there, there are a few, there are just a few questions I think that um, I should, uh, could respond to. Um, the first one is really related to the issue of um, the policy. I think two honourable members uh, mentioned that the policies for allowances at um, NISFAS, um, and this specifically is related to the TVET allowances and the um, uh, problems in terms of the, the level of funding for TVET. Um, the ministerial task team is really focusing on the aspects of NISFAS's operations and functioning and the model of NISFAS itself, not on policy issues. And um, we wouldn't want to put policy issues into that as well, because this has got to be done at a different level. But the issue of the policies around um, funding of students is something that has to be reviewed. And it does get reviewed on a on a yearly basis, but it's also linked to the um, uh, quantum of funding that is available 
in um, the system to support students. So while it is an important issue and it has to be dealt with in the longer run, it's not something that should be part necessarily of the ministerial task team's work. So I think that's the, the, the first um, issue. Minister, in terms of some of the questions around the ISFAP and um, uh, some of the comments that were made around it, I, I think it might be uh, useful to understand that because we were unable to um, uh, you know, pilot ISFAP in the way we had intentioned, intended to at the beginning, ISFAP is actually a very small bursary scheme at the moment. In 2019, it only had 1,000, about 1,250 uh, students funded through the public sector. So while it's, um, you know, it's really supporting those students and it's a welcome addition in terms of bursaries to the system, it's quite a small scheme. As we go forward um, and we look at how we try to understand the overall um, ecosystem for the bursaries, we're going to have to look at all those different um, uh, bursaries that are offered in the system to try and bring them in. And I think this relates to the, the, the point made by the chair in terms of the support that is provided to um, students at um, institutions by the various uh, government departments and um, CETAs and uh, state-owned enterprises, etc. Um, and of course, there's also a lot of other bursary schemes that are out there, and we don't know the full the full um, uh, extent of all of that funding in the system. We have tried in the past to get uh, uh, better information on it, but it's not an easy thing to do. Um, it, it, but it is something that would be helpful. Um, the issue of uh, not having only government um, responsible for for uh, supporting students in TVETs and universities is a critical issue that needs to be um, dealt with. Um, I think the other, the, the, the next issue, the issue around the historic debt and the amount of funding that was made available um, uh, by um, Minister Pandor in the a previous year um, and how much of that has actually been um, allocated thus far, I think is uh, a, a, an issue that has a number of different technical um, explanations. Um, you will perhaps recall that in um, 20, during 2018, National Treasury, the department and DPME worked together to do a due diligence um, around the historic debt owed by students who were registered in 2018 at universities. So those students who had come, been there uh, earlier, been funded through the previous grant scheme and were carrying various amounts of debt. And we quantified at that time that there were around about 55,000 students who um, were in that category and um, that amount of funding was quantified and made available to NISFAS to, um, to, uh, to support these students. In the process of verifying that those students were students who legitimately could be funded through this fund, um, a number of uh, issues came up and that work is still ongoing, which is why the, the number, uh, the amount of funding that is actually um, provided does change. Um, we, in fact, provided additional funding as well to NISFAS at that particular time, something in the region of 1.7 billion, um, which was approved by National Treasury, because we recognised that we would need to think about um, the students leaving the system, the students who were on the capped funding, um, leaving the system over the next few years, and that there would have to be funding to support them to ensure that by the end, they were debt free. Um, I think the, the, the next one really, Minister, is in relation to the, um, the, the issue that you had mentioned around the NISFAS IT systems that had been put in place that um, cost the amount of about 100 billion. That was, um, I think, approved in 2012, 2013, which was when 
NISFAS was busy looking at their central system. NISFAS board and NISFAS itself were obviously responsible for that at, at the time, which is why that becomes su such an important aspect of um, the ministerial task team's work, to really understand and unpack what happened and why we've got a system that is not effectively working. There was um, a question around uh, that system still failing our students now. I think it needs to be said that um, the NISFAS administrator during the last um, year and uh, 18 months since he's been there has been focused on supporting, um, uh, improving that system. So they ha the system has been improved over the period. Whether or not that system is fully fit for purpose will have to be identified, but certainly it is not operating in the way it operated and failed in 2017. Um, a lot of that work has been done and it has been um, uh, fixed up. Um, in terms of the, the N plus two rule, the question around that and students who've been just deregistered, um, that issue has been dealt with, I think, both in a media statement that um, you, you had, Minister had made, um, but it, it, it is this issue about students who were initially funded at the beginning of the year and then were unfunded because they were either on programs that ought not to have been funded or they were identified as, as students who had received funding for a long period of time and had out, um, were no longer, uh, uh, the minister has indicated that 9,000 students were identified and there is a process that's underway looking specifically at those individual cases to, to ensure that administrative justice is um, um, put in place. Um, minister, I think that really does cover the main, um, the main questions that were answered by others, I think you would be able to cover um, more effectively. Thank you. Uh, okay, thanks, Chair. Is, is Aruna uh, able to say something? Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like... Let, let, okay, Chair, let me just take this opportunity then uh, to round off. <clears throat> Uh, firstly, let me just say thank you very much to you, Chair, and, and on all, all the honourable members uh, for their comments and uh, in some instances useful suggestions and areas that we perhaps also need to consider further. That's, that's highly appreciated. But on some specific things then that I thought I need to... To, to say. Firstly, Professor Pozzoli, I accept your apology um, and the fact that you acknowledge that uh, you, you made a mistake in the manner in which you read our statement. And I appreciate that. Uh, the, 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 the thing, though, that I don't agree with is that given the resources that we have in this country, in the financial sector, I don't believe that we can fail to actually design a ready-made affordable higher education loan scheme to address the missing middle. I mean, when we sometimes raise these matters, it's as if we are arguing for reckless usage of pension and provident fund, not at all. Also, it's as if these funds are all being nicely and carefully invested. It's a fact that billions of friends are being siphoned off by middlemen, and it's often men in the financial sector. Whether you are talking on medical aid schemes, whether you are, you are talking of pension and provident funds, whether you are even talking of the insurance sector, and so on. And also, some of these monies are being invested in a manner that sometimes is not supportive of addressing the triple challenges of poverty, inequality, and unemployment. At the very least, we should explore that, rather than to dismiss it upfront and say, we can't actually be looking at the 12 trillion rands in provident and pension funds, which can be used not to waste, 
but which after a few years, seven years, as it's sometimes been said, they are actually going to start paying back. And in fact, possibility of having a self-sustainable scheme that would not require any further uh, investment by government for that matter, or the, or, the, or the private sector. In any case, COVID-19, if anything else, is, is impelling us to actually build a new economy. And building that new economy means we have to mobilize domestic resources in a manner that will direct funds towards building productive economy, investing in infrastructure, and so on. Why can't we engage on that and debate and explore that? I honestly do believe that we can be able to find a viable scheme. In any case, in my capacity as the minister overall responsible for research, amongst other things, I want to set aside some funds and also mobilize the, the sake chairs on the economy to actually do proper research into the financial sector in our country in support of the kind of economy we need to be building post-COVID-19. We think that's an absolute imperative and our science sector has a duty and I want to direct some of them to focus on this particular question. Now, I'm glad Dr. Parker has corrected me. I was, I was much more, I don't know where I took the figure of 8,000 for ISFAP, maybe it was the, the optimist in me. I mean, 1,215 is virtually nothing, frankly, given the scale of the, of the, of the problem. Honorable note that, uh, I thought that I outlined the project plan for the NESFAS review. I said that it's six months. Well, as far as I can go now, I'm not the one who's going to be actually implementing it. But I am hoping that very soon the team will be meeting and then give more flesh to the plan uh, so that then they are able to meet the six months deadline that I've, 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 I've given. Yes, you are right. It would have been ideal. I said that up front that we should have had the report of this review, the committee of inquiry before the end of the administration of the administrator, but it's not been possible. So uh, we will have to do with uh, what the reality that we have on how then we handle uh, the, the, the report. But I, I, I do uh, say that much as I may not accept every recommendation they make, but I take the investigation, the inquiry very seriously, and I will intend to implement as many of their reasonable possible justified uh, recommendations, given the confidence I actually have in the team. And also thanks for welcoming uh, the members of the team. Now, uh, Dr. Parker also has addressed, let's not use this ministerial task team, which has got a very specific task to focus on business processes, to then undertake research. We hear what honorable members are saying about NESFAS students who are in Tibet and universities and so on. Those are policy matters that would actually require further engagement and, and discussions. Of course, Honorable note that uh, the, 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 this team will have to look into what are, what's the quantum of the, of the, of the so-called missing middle. We'll have to get that as part of this, uh, in, uh, uh, as part of uh, addressing, sorry, not the team. The issue of how many students are in the missing middle, let me start from scratch, it's something that will have to be investigated and be factored into as I deal with the processes of the missing middle. Now, a few questions have been asked there. Uh, what I had committed, Comrade Chair, you will write, is that I would like that before the end of the financial year, at the very least, there is a proposal on how we can deal with the missing middle. Of course, that is dependent on a whole range of factors, which I hope that the committee has a better appreciation of now, having taken through the work that was done from 2016, of what this requires and how extensive it is, the amount of further work perhaps that may need to be done. 
although a lot of groundwork has been done. But that is my view that at the very least, before the end of the financial year, we need to be having some kind of proposal on how to deal. If we are able to move beyond that, all the better. But there are so many imponderables at the moment. But government is committed to do its bit in, to facilitate the addressing of the issues of the missing middle. From the look of things now, given government's commitment on NESPAS, this will have to be a private sector. And of course, it will have to be a partnership with government. As to what that translates into, that's what I want to move. And some of the discussions we said that we are actually having and the more structured advice that I'm, I'm seeking, I've started looking into at this point in time. The time frame, as I've said, well, I've addressed that now. And Honorable Nota died asked about the time frame, because I was looking at a proposal at least before the end of the financial year. I I, I don't know, uh, Honorable Nota, you are worrying me a bit when you say that the issue of the missing middle and what I've just said does not appear in the APP. I'll have to go back and check that because my senior staff were very much aware of the commitment I made, uh, Chair, as you said, to NESFAS, to SAUS, sorry, at the beginning of the year as to what my time frames are in exploring this issue of what is to be done about the missing media. If it's not there, I'm asking my officials to go and double check that we will have to make an addendum and include that. Because I, 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 my officials, as far as I know, they were fully aware of the commitment I've made in terms of taking this matter forward. So it should be there to indicate that. The issue of TVETs and SRCs, again, that's a matter, strictly speaking, that doesn't fall within the brief that we had been asked on whether some TVET colleges are suppressing SRCs and all that. I hope that the officials are noting this is something that they may want to, to look into so that we don't allow it to, to drop. Uh, Honorable Mananiso, thanks for your suggestion and support. We will indeed strengthen communication. Look, I must just say this, that the Department of Higher Education and Training has the single highest number of entities of any other government department. No other government department has the number of entities that we have, according to the Auditor General. Because our universities are almost like full entities of their own, and Tibet colleges, as it were. My worry that I've been having increasingly from my experience in this department is that we have not had proper stakeholder relations management processes at capacity. I'm building that. I've started building that now because communication also is as good as your ability to effectively engage the stakeholders, to listen to them as well as to inform them of what is, is being done. It's, it's been a problem that a department like this has not had this. So in my own reflections now, it's been very clear in fact, around 2016, 2017, it's something I was beginning to think about seriously. How do we build capacity for dynamic, ongoing stakeholder management? It's very crucial. It's like, for instance, the other issue, Chair, of, of, of governance. We are putting out many of our institutions under administration, whether it's the CITAS, whether it's TVET colleges, whether it's universities. It requires that we build some capacity on effective monitoring and evaluation of our entities as well as building governance capacity. It can't be that every year we have an institution under administration. It points to the fact that there's also a lot that we, more that we need to do. But I appreciate the fact that some of the honorable members at least uh, Sorry, realize that we are trying our best to walk the talk. That is why, Honorable Kietze, I really would have been very worried if the FF was saying I'm doing well. I really would have taken the biggest, next biggest mirror to look at what is wrong with myself if the FF was saying I'm doing so well. 
I always expect that from the EFF, also for political reasons that the EFF. I'm very proud of my own contribution, by the way, in this sector, which doesn't start yesterday when I became minister in 2009. It goes far back in my days as, as an academic activist, the research I have done, the work that I have done. It doesn't start as a minister. But as a minister also, I am very par proud of some path-breaking interventions. During the existence of the DHT, for instance, we have grown Tibet colleges, we have grown NESFAS, we have grown universities in a huge way. So I'm very proud. I'm more than happy, by the way, that you invite me to the next Congress of the EFF to actually outline these things directly. Many of your own members are beneficiaries of the work that I've, I've, I've actually done. So uh, you can debate me and disagree, I don't mind, but the facts are a complete opposite of what you are, you are saying. Now, on the IT system, we will need to, 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 to have an IT system that's, that fits the bill. In fact, my own mind now, Chair, is on something much bigger than your, your conventional IT systems that we talk about. We need to move to sophisticated data analytics. And for NESFAS, we need that. For the post-school education and training system, we need that. In this day and age of data, that is why one of the things I'm looking at is the possibility of changing one of my chief directories to actually become chief director data systems. That's where the world is going. And without these proper data systems, we are not going to work. Next first, that will have to be done. I am hoping that out of the recommendations of the committee of inquiry that I have appointed, they will reflect on this particular matter. I'm the one who has raised concern. In fact, it was 2012, 2013 when I appointed, when, when I gave, I approved 100 million rands to be spent on the IT system. I'm the one who have raised it that I think I need to go back and check why is it that the system was fine, so, so wanting. I'm the one who has raised that. It's not been raised by anybody. So is the issue of infrastructure, but I don't want to go into infrastructure now. If the committee at some stage would like me to come back and give a briefing on what I am doing on infrastructure uh, for the post-school education and training system, I'll be happy to do that, Chair. So let, let me not venture into that. And the issue of NESFAS money being handled by the banks, of course, that's the banking system we have. That's why there's talk of building a state bank so that you diversify the banking sector. Who banks? Government will bank with the, one of the big four banks, or some, or all of them. That, that is the banking system that we have. So that doesn't justify that, therefore, we must say NESFAS has been handed over to the bank. NESFAS is a government entity that we are handling as government under my department. It's not an entity that is handled by the banks. In fact, it would be very interesting to know, Honorable Kietze, where do you bank your own money? Which bank do you use? My guess is that you are in one of the big four banks yourself. I don't have a bank, me. I don't use a bank. <laughs> it, that surely can't be true. How do you receive your salary? Parliament doesn't pay people in envelopes every Friday. You, you, your salary gets deposited somewhere before the EFF takes half of it or something like that. Now, at the the... The other matter, Chair, that I, I thought that I, I, I need to say, N plus two is not aimed at student activists. It's aimed at students as a whole. As government, we have a right to say, students we support must be able to finish their degrees or diplomas or certificates within a particular period. It's only fair. The whole world does that. All sponsors actually do that. So it can't be that we have got limitless amounts of time. This thing of professional students, people who are proud that I've spent eight years, nine years as a student, but you don't see requisite progress during that time. It's something we just cannot allow. Yet we do realize as government 
Mm-hmm. There are many challenges that are facing students. That is why NESFAS is now a bursary because we want to provide as much of a wraparound to support students. But over and above that, each year we spend billions of friends, both in the university and Tibet system, to support learning and teaching in order to improve throughput rates. Because we realize that our students come from hugely uneven backgrounds, and we want to address that. But also students themselves have a duty and responsibility to work hard. And that is why we are prescribing to say no one can actually be allowed to finish his or her degree now or diploma in more than one more year than the required time. And we shouldn't be apologetic about that as a country. It's not targeting student activism. Now, maybe, Honorable uh, Kieta, the issue of student activism may have to form a discussion at some stage. Because other countries, what they do, they, they regulate who serves in the SRC and how long. For instance, they would say in some other Is countries. Time for lunch, uh, Minister. Yeah? Is it time for lunch? I see they are bringing you uh, lunch now. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. If they're just bringing me coffee, that's all. Just to oh. wet in my throat. I'll be finished just now, Che. Okay. I, 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 I think that this matter that Honorable Kete is, is raising, we, we, need, we may need to have another debate because I know in other countries, for instance, we are not allowed to serve in the SRC for more than a year, in others, two years. And those, some of them that allow you not to serve more than a year, during that year, you take a holiday from your studies so that you focus on serving the students. Those are issues that we might have to actually debate because indeed some of student activists, because some of them almost serve forever as student leaders, it does affect their performance, some of them. Is that what we want in our system or we actually need to look into that? In fact, that's a factor we might want to build into the issue of the SRCs and the kinds of discussions that we should have. We don't want to suppress democracy. But it is an issue. That is why maybe Honorable Theatre is even saying with N plus two, we are targeting student leaders. No, but it is a challenge that some student leaders spend too long at, at, at our institutions, which is not supposed to be the case. Now, Honorable uh, Boshoff, there are still students who are supported by private companies, the SOEs, including our own sitters, by the way. They do fund a lot of students. So that is still happening. Sometimes the challenge we have is to check that there are no students who are double dipping, who get NESFAS and also are being supported by, by others because we should not allow double dipping because we don't have enough resources. We must stretch our resources as widely as possible. The issue of banks and the appetite, I must say, this is a little bit more anecdotal based on informal advice that. I was getting from some of the people who understand the financial sector and the banking system and who have some interest in issue of student support, who are saying that it does not look. In fact, we, we can do a quick study. What percentage of bank loans are student loans? For instance, in South Africa today, it shouldn't be difficult to, to, to get that. It's something perhaps that will also have to, because that will give us a much more reliable indicator whether there is an uh, appetite uh, on, or not. Chair, thank you very much for your, for your, for your kind remarks and, and, and for your support uh, uh, to the work that we are actually doing, whilst at the same time not abandoning your responsibility to ask hard questions where you have to ask them, which we appreciate. Also, it, it keeps us on our toes and makes us to to think. And once more, thank you very much for this session. I think that I've responded, we've responded to all the questions. Unless if there is one we've missed, Chair, we're very happy that you pointed out. Otherwise, it looks like we've covered everything. It has been a fairly enriching session. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister, I think you have covered all the questions that the members have raised. Uh, some of the issues, I think, they are ongoing debates. 
Chair, will continue to have those debates uh, as members of this committee. There is a point that you raised which I, I wanted to comment on, but I sort of uh, forgotten. Uh, <clears throat> you are meeting with the chairpersons of uh, university councils. I think it's an important meeting. Um, we ourselves have noted a tendency that is beginning to emerge. I am not sure whether it's beginning to emerge or it has been there all the time of uh, overprotectiveness on the part of the University Council, uh, emphasizing their statutory powers and their institutional autonomy. That uh, nobody can tell them anything uh, because they are solely responsible for running the University Councils. Now, it's, it's, it's a posture that is very problematic. Uh, I, for instance, have picked it up in a number of institutions where we wanted to engage, have an honest engagement. And uh, you will be sort of reminded of uh, this issue of institutional autonomy. No, we are council with the power. Although it's not official, but uh, it's implicit in how they respond uh, to some of the engagement. <clears throat> so I think uh, it's, it's an important meeting because, and you know, uh, it's important for them to understand that they are responsible to account publicly. They are accountable to the public, although they are not elected, which is also something that is a little bit strange. You've got unelected people wielding so much power and not being accountable to the public. Uh, but of course, that is the, the nature of the, of the legal system that we have put in place to protect these universities. Uh, but I think it's been overstretched a little bit. So have that engagement. And I think uh, uh, we our request is that you must remind them that they are answerable to the public. They are performing a public function. And uh, institutions like ourselves, uh, if we demand that they must be accountable, they should be. So that would be our our request that that should be the message that you carry with them. But I think overall, thank you very much for a very good discussion. I'm looking forward to this uh, research by the Commission on Higher Education on the remuneration of vice chancellors, so that once and for all, this matter can then be put to rest. Uh, and thank you very much that you are also supporting <clears throat> Uh, that process uh, that we said that we need to look into it. Uh, we know that it's, it's not going to be easy. Uh, not everybody else is going to be happy about the process, but I think if we've got a determination to attend to this matter, because generally throughout government, you know, uh, we've introduced austerity measures there were instances where I think this year the president has said nobody's going to get an increase. It's all in the effort of making sure that we these austerity measures introduce <clears throat> in, uh, in, in public finances. And therefore to get uh, one of the sector in the public uh, behaving their salaries not been looked at and not been, you know, attended to consistent with the challenges that the country is facing. Uh, it's a bit worrying, uh, but so I'm looking forward to that, uh, <clears throat> uh, Comrade uh, Minister. Just to say to Honorable Bosho, and probably I think there was a point that was raised, I think, by Honorable Pozzoli that ours is a developmental state. Ours is a state that will intervene in the interest of development in the country. 
Uh, we don't proclaim to be a welfare state, but a developmental state. And therefore, a developmental state will be interested in, in how uh, its people develop uh, educationally. <clears throat> and therefore, we cannot just leave it to the market uh, for the missing middle to be, to fend for themselves. The state must look into it and try and facilitate that they too get opportunities to access higher education. So the notion that the market, people must just fend for themselves and all of that, I think it's a wrong notion, uh, which is not consistent with the ideals of a developmental state. So minister continue to look into that so that we find a lasting solution to the issue of the missing middle. But otherwise, thank you very much uh, and thanks for your time. Uh, there are issues that ordinarily you may delegate to get the DG, to get the officials to come and brief us. But on this one, we thought that, no, we, we needed you to come precisely because of the nature of the issues that we were dealing with. But otherwise, thank you very much. The meeting uh, is adjourned. <clears throat> okay, maybe I must just say that we uh, maybe also take advantage of your presence, Honorable Minister, that the committee has taken a resolution to look into the appointment of Professor Mbati at the University of uh, Swagomakato, his suitability to hold that office given a myriad of uh, allegations against him, uh, sexual allegations that have been hanging on his head and for which he has not been held to account at the, when he was a uh, vice chancellor at the University of uh, Venda and uh, many other allegations uh, about his leadership style. So we are going to do an inquiry. There is going to be two parts, it's part A and part B. Uh, and the part A session will be starting next Friday if we are granted the six hours that we have applied for. So <clears throat> we'd like to look at into that because the council went ahead and made that appointment and it turned out to be a very controversial appointment when that council had an outstanding engagement with ourselves because there are quite a number of issues that uh, that has been brought to our attention, including by the former Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor DBA, and the current issues, of course, that involves uh, some of the governance challenges there at the university. So we, we, we are going to be putting them under, under scrutiny uh, starting next week. It's going to be intense. Uh, we have developed a a concept paper for that. We are very happy to share it uh, with the department because there will be a point where we will be asking the department to also come and brief us. Uh, both for part A for part B, part A being the Sfako Mahato appointment, all these allegations that have been raised, governance ones, uh, against that council and also on the part B, on the his role as, at the University of Venda. There are issues around uh, abandoned infrastructure projects, uh, which, which would also like the department. We did receive a report from the department and we are very happy for that. But we'll just schedule a formal briefing by the department. I would not necessarily ask the minister, but if the minister is available, he can also uh, uh, come and interact with us, but we wouldn't want to involve you, uh, Honorable Minister, at this stage. We would like it to be just a committee process. So yeah, so next Friday, and we have also uh, thought that it's, it's advisable that we get a last briefing on the uh, on uh, the 2020 academic year. So we are planning it for next week. 
So we'd like uh, the minister, if you're available, to be present, uh, just to take us through uh, the current, what what is happening, the, uh, the, the efforts of the department to save the 2020 the academic year. But if there are some challenges, we can always uh, look at that off the record and make a determination. So that is that, honorable members. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. If there is nothing, uh, uh, I will uh, adjourn the meeting. Is there anything from any member? Honorable Minister, you are fine. I'm fine, Chair. Thank you very much for the briefing that you have given us at the end. The heads up. Thank you. Okay. All right, the meeting uh, is adjourned. Thank you very much. We are fine, Chair. You asked us if we are fine. I saw Thomas does respond. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Long live. And we wish that we had just not paid through envelopes. This thing of <laughs> banks were not centralized. <laughs> For envelopes, <laughs> 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 we're not yet. We're not yet. We're Yeah, we. I prefer an envelope. That thing is key, <laughs> not banks. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, honorable members. Bye. Thank you, Minister. And keep safe, please. Yeah.